Thank you. Can we hear me? Okay. Whenever the people are well informed, Thomas Jefferson wrote, they can be trusted with their own government. But what happens today, 239 years later, when the world is completely transformed from those times with science and technology? Science and technology that is ubiquitous, altering every aspect of our lives, but that's also somehow magical. Because if you can't sit at your kitchen table and make a cell phone like you could make a radio or even a television with a kit a generation ago, it ceases to become something that is a matter of know-how, of knowledge, and becomes more like magic. We don't really know quite how it works. We just know that it does. And that transforms information from the realm of knowledge more into the realm of belief. And we see that happening now throughout our political system. It's happening on both the right and the left. And I'll give you one example from both sides. In 2010, on the left, using cell phones as one example, the San Francisco Board of Supervisors voted 10 to 1, all of them Democrats, to require every cell phone shop in the city to warn you that your cell phone may be causing brain cancer. The problem with that is, is it wasn't based on science. In fact, if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum in this slide, you'll see that microwaves have a little bit more energy than radio waves, but far less than the infrared radiation each of our bodies is emitting as we sit here. We're all emitting about 90 watts of infrared radiation. You have to go all the way through the infrared spectrum, through the visible light spectrum of radiation that our eyes interpret as information, to the bottom end of ultraviolet light, which we protect against with sunscreen, before a photon has enough energy to knock an electron out of a carbon atom, thereby ionizing it, changing the way it chemically bonds, and potentially changing your DNA, giving you cancer. But you have to know a little bit about physics, a little bit about biology, a little bit about chemistry, and be able to synthesize that information to put that together to know why cell phone is safe. And that's where the problem is with the well-informed voter. It's hard to do that. On the political right, we see the same kind of thing happening with this question of knowledge versus belief. We see a lot of candidates for president this cycle and last talking about how they don't believe in the science of climate change or global warming. But similarly, that is based on, in this case, billions of data points accumulated through hundreds of thousands of experiments done by tens of thousands of scientists over the last 50 years. It's supported by so many independent lines of data that the National Academy of Sciences now calls it settled science. And yet, we see these politicians saying that they don't believe in it, as if it is a matter that could be debated as an opinion rather than knowledge. Clearly, something is beginning to break down in our national political discussion and in discussions throughout Western democracies when it comes to complex science subjects and how we manage them. Now, this is posing some emerging problems. On this slide, there are several of these emerging problems, all of them driven by science and technology. None of them solved. We are getting stuck in many of the ways that are actually influencing all our lives and the life and the future of the planet most profoundly. So what can we do about it? Well, consider what's going on first. Look at those blue lines on that globe. What do you suppose those are? Those represent Facebook connections, but they may as well represent connections between scientists collaborating over the internet. Today, scientists can work together around the world regardless of their geography or their time zone collaborating to create what is projected to be as much new knowledge over the next 40 years as we've created over the last 400 years since the beginning of the scientific revolution. So clearly, if we're going to continue to govern ourselves with democracy, we need some kind of new model. So the question is, is are the people still well enough informed to be trusted with their own government? I like that one. It, the signs kind of go well together, I think. If you judge from the National Press Corps, the answer is clearly no. In early 2008, the then uh, chief anchors of all these uh, different television news programs asked the then candidates for president 
2,975 questions, almost 3,000 questions, conducted in 171 different interviews. How many of you suppose were about climate change or global warming? No matter which side of the aisle you're on, arguably the biggest economic and environmental question facing us. The answer is six. To put that in perspective, they asked them three questions about UFOs. <laughs> That's the relative importance that the National Press Corps gives to these big science questions. Probably because most of them ran away from science in college. And they assume that the public isn't interested. Somebody had to try to do something about this. So I joined with five other co-founders and created an organization, an online petition called sciencedebate.org, in which we asked the candidates for president to debate these big science issues that are starting to influence every aspect of our life. We needed to find some means of incorporating them into our national political dialogue. It went viral. Within a few weeks, we had over 38,000 scientists and engineers sign on, including the presidents of almost every major American university, members of Congress, organizationally, almost all of the major science and technology organizations, dozens of Nobel laureates, prominent writers and artists. Clearly, there was a need that the politicians in the news media really weren't hearing. So what do you suppose their reaction to this was? Crickets. <laughs> Crickets. They thought that it was a niche topic, is what the news directors said when I spoke to some of them that there weren't enough people that would really be interested in this. So we decided to do a little science ourselves and to test this. And we teamed up with Research America and we did a national Harris poll. And we found that, in fact, that wasn't true. 85% of the American public thought the candidates for president ought to be debating these big topics, that we had entered a new era. And we need to be discussing the way that these things are changing our lives. So that begs the question, how is it that journalists were getting it so wrong? Well, part of the problem is that for two generations, journalists have been taught that there is no such thing as objectivity. Here it is in a New Reporter Guidelines. This is just one example out of hundreds that you can find. But if reporters are taught this, it's a problem in an age when science is a major input into most of our big public policy decisions, because science is about objectivity. It's about culling that little tiny bit of information out of our political identity, our gender identity, our religious identity, our sexual orientation, our racial identity, and finding the one objective truth that is true no matter who measures it. It may be true to say that, as Linda Ellerby does, that there is no such thing as objectivity if you're interviewing people on a political issue. But just because science can be political, we shouldn't confuse it as politics alone. Because it's not about opinion, it's about knowledge. Here, even Nick Gillespie is saying that there is no such thing as objectivity. Nick is the editor-in-chief of Reason.com, an objectivist publication. So if he's, even he's saying that, we've got something to talk about in American journalism. We decided to test this assumption that it was a niche topic beyond that. And we organized a debate at the Franklin Institute in downtown Center City, Philadelphia, shortly before the Pennsylvania primary. We publicized it, invited the candidates. David Brancaccio was going to moderate. PBS was going to broadcast. And instead, they chose to debate faith and religion at Messiah College in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Something had fundamentally transformed in our American public dialogue when it was less taboo to talk about faith and religion than it was to talk about science. The question is, is what could that be? I worked with Jane Lubchenco, the immediate past president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And we organized a presidential science debate at the University of Oregon as the primary season moved west. Once again, they turned us down and debated faith and religion at uh, Saddleback Church in California with Pastor Rick Warren. So what is going on in our public dialogue that we are unable to dis discern the difference between knowledge and belief and that we focus on belief matters versus the knowledge matters? Here's a picture of me up in Rocky Mountain National Park. Shortly before the Democratic National Convention, I was up there hiking with my son, leaning into a 60 mile an hour wind. And it was fun to do that and fun to be there with him, but it was a bittersweet moment because I'd been working for over a year to try to get the candidates to 
do this, to sign on, because this is such an important topic. And I felt like I had let down the entire U.S. science establishment. It was a lot of pressure and it was very public because I knew that after the Democratic National Convention, we were going to get into the, con the uh, debate season that was controlled by the Commission on Presidential Debates. And they were very structured in what they were going to do, and it didn't involve uh, science topics. But as I came down the mountain, my cell phone, that magic cell phone, started buzzing with voicemails from the Obama campaign. They were going to engage. They decided to do it, but they wouldn't do it on TV. They only agreed to do it online. Still, it was something, so we went ahead with that. It's progress. It's hard to transform a big public dialogue like this. John McCain agreed, and shortly after that, we went forward and posted those uh, answers, and science debate and the discussions that it raised made more than 850 million media impressions, totally obliterating the idea that this was a niche topic that people weren't interested in. In fact, the stories generated more stories, which generated more stories and more commentary. President Obama included our mission statement to restore science to its rightful place in his inaugural address, and he appointed several of our earliest supporters to top-level cabinet positions, making his administration at that point in time perhaps the most science-friendly in American history. So a small group of people passionately committed can indeed make a difference. But the bigger question is, is what are we going to do to continue this forward? Because these big issues are still dogging us. And with the acceleration and the creation of new knowledge, we still need to find a better way to incorporate them into the democratic process. So we begin to solve them and move forward consciously. It's not enough to just answer them online. We need to fill these podiums with live people and a live debate to really understand their sense of the role that science plays in modern society. You can help. Pull out your cell phone, if you will, now or during the break. Go to sciencedebate.org, sign on, and please ask your friends to do so, too. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you.